Let's begin by reading our passage. Genesis 2, verses 21 to 25. I like the NIV there, the united. I like that, united. We began our look at this passage in our last session with a brief look at verse 21. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Adam is put to sleep so that Yahweh God can perform the first recorded surgery during the first anesthetic. This was not a trance or a state of, of ecstasy, ecstasy, as some suggest. The Hebrew tardema means a sound, sensible sleep, which is where, where you want to be when you're under the knife for six or seven hours. <coughs> I want to be out. After the fall... God will not hesitate to inflict pain upon man, but here he intends a painless surgery. And I suggested last week we imagine the profound difference if Yahweh God had made the first woman in the way he made the first man. Then Yahweh God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. Genesis 2.7. If Yahweh God had repeated the same process in his making of the first woman, where would be the unity? Where would be that intimate association? She'd just be somebody else over here, made out of dirt. Instead, we have in verse 23, Adam's immediate and exquisite realization that this one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman because this one was taken out of man. Paraphrased, oh boy. She was not drawn from the dust, but from the bone and flesh of the man. She was not given breath from Yahweh God, but received the breath of life from the body of the man. If, without reading anything into God's word, it doesn't say that God gave her breath. We can only assume she got it from the man. Thus they were, by the manner of the woman's creation, effectively conjoined. Kyle and Delish write, The woman was created not of dust of the earth, but from a rib of Adam, because she was formed for an inseparable unity and fellowship of life with the man. And the mode of her creation was to lay the actual foundation for the moral ordinance of marriage. The woman's manner of creation also means that we cannot derive from this two beginnings of the human race, one in Adam and one in Eve. There was only one beginning of the human race in Adam. So now verse 22, And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman. God not only used different materials for his creation of the woman, but he also used a different process. Adam had been formed. He had been molded. It's the same word used for molding a pot or a work of art or even a pagan idol. Same word. Damp clay formed into a utilitarian vessel or a work of art. 
The Hebrew word is yatsar. For God's creation of the woman, the verb changes. None of our common versions translate it literally. I could only find it in Young's literal translation and the Tree of Life version. The latter, which reads, I, I'm sorry, we're full up. If you're not here for the prayers, well, then you're out of luck. The Tree of Life version reads, Adonai Elohim built the rib, which he had taken from the man into a woman. And that's the word. That's exactly what it means. Different from the molding that was used for the man, the Hebrew word is vebana, vebana. And it means to build to develop, to construct, such as a permanent residence or a temple. According to Leupold, quote, it applies to the fashioning of a structure of some importance. It involves constructive effort, end quote. It's thus a picture of Yahweh constructing Fashioning the woman piece by piece. We should also make note that the biblical order for husband and wife, her subordinate position under the familial and spiritual head that we read from the Apostle Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, 8 to 9, 11 to 12, has its foundation prior to the fall. I mean, some might think, well, you know, sort of like Jesus talked about divorce that we'll mention in a moment, that, well, it wasn't part of God's original plan, but He let you do it because you were going to do it anyway. That's not the case. This, in, in the pristine first dwelling, the first man, first woman, still sinless. It was God who ordained this relationship, not sin. And that, again, when Jesus was posed the question about divorce, he said, yeah, well, it wasn't part of the Father's original idea. But he let Moses, he told Moses to let you do it because you're going to do it anyway. A little lamp will paraphrase there. And he brought her to the man. I love this. I love this phrase, this clause at the end. And he brought her to the man. It's a beautiful antecedent to the tradition of the bride's father formally offering his daughter to the groom. That's I was unable to find any evidence that our traditional marriage ceremony was purposely modeled after Genesis 2, these, this passage, but we clearly see the parallels in the text. Verse 22 ends with the picture of the bride's father walking his daughter down the aisle. And here he represents not just her dad and the pater, pater familias, but at least in the traditional, and some would say, sadly, old-fashioned, picture of the young virginal bride heretofore, he's been the only man in her life, her father, her dad. That was it. And that same man is now handing her over to another man. So here's a, a changing of the guards, so to speak. A handing over from one man to another. And I can imagine, I can only imagine, but I can imagine that it's no small thing for a loving father to give his daughter to a younger man. I think my father-in-law probably said, over my dead body. <laughs> In the creation text, Yahweh God is truly the father, literal creator of the woman. He made her. 
He alone is the one to hand her over. And it, to me, it's a picture of a gracious gift from father to groom. He hands her over to the man. He, and here's what I love about this. He brings her. He presents her to the man. He says, here she is. And he gives her. Then the exultation expressed by Adam in verse 23 conjures up, frankly, what I felt in my heart as I watched my beautiful bride being conducted down the aisle toward me. Lo, 53 years ago. Verse 23. Then the man said, This one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. To succinctly translate this into modern vernacular, he's saying, finally, here's the woman for me. Along with, oh boy. Here we have the first recorded words from the lips of the first man. And it's about his girl. Fitting. Some claim that what he says reveals that the transfer from his body to Eve's involved more than just a bone. Because he says flesh. Flesh of my flesh. Perhaps. But it also can be just an expression, which it is later. Such as it was used by Laban to declare its familial tie to Jacob. Turn please to Genesis 29. Genesis 29. Let's read verses 13 to 14. So it came about when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. And I've included in the handout, you can also find this in Judges 9.2 to 2 Samuel 5, 1, 2 Samuel 19, 12 to 13. So it, we see that this becomes a traditional saying. You are my kin. You are like me. You are family. Of course, if it became a figurative expression later, it had to begin with Adam. So knowing that he meant Knowing what he meant by it, what the first man meant by it, is hard to determine. How cognizant was he of what happened while he was asleep? Martin Luther concludes that Adam knew exactly what he was saying. Here's what he writes. It is worthy of our greatest wonder and admiration that Adam, the moment he glanced his eye on Eve, knew her to be a building formed out of himself. He immediately said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. These are not the words of an ignorant one, nor of one who is a sinner, nor of one who is ignorant of the works and of the creation of God. They are the words of one righteous and wise and full of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps. I think he's attributing an awful lot to the first man. So I appreciate a comment from David Guzik. Here's what he writes. What exactly did God take from Adam's side to make Eve? We don't really know, and it doesn't really matter. Modern research into cloning and genetic replication shows every cell in our body contains the body's entire genetic blueprint. God took some of Adam's cells and changed their genetic blueprint in the creation of Eve. That tracks. Does it really matter what part, what bone, what flesh, if any? No, God took a part of Adam and remade it into a woman. Period. Could have been a rib, could have been more. Doesn't really matter. God can do anything he wants. Doesn't matter the specific part Yahweh extracted from Adam. 
far more important is the fact that God did it, that God chose the man as the source. That's the biggie. And that these two facts combined ensured a unique bond between the man and woman. To me, although it's different, very different from how he created Adam, it's really saying the same thing about our relationship to God. God the Father. He cares about us. He, I've always put it in terms of he, he, he doesn't mind getting his hands dirty in our lives. He cares about us. He loves us. Even to when he, where he makes the first man and woman. The first one he molds into out of mud or dirt. The second he builds out of the first. Adam continues, This one shall be called woman because this one was taken out of man. Well, let me pause. Any, any thoughts, any questions before I proceed? Okay, so Adam continues, This one shall be called woman, because this one was taken out of man. The etymology between these words, and it occurred to me to maybe define etymology, since I've used it several times already, the study of the origin and history of words, or a study of this type relating to one particular word. So the etymology, the origin behind the words woman, and man is really more complicated and convoluted than the text and the traditional explanation make it. I've made every effort to keep this direct and succinct. I fear I may have failed in that regard. But trust me, I've filtered a lot out. And in fact, I, if you care to go for the notes, I've included a sidebar in the notes that I'm not going to read here because it would just make matters even worse. For example, the margin notes in my Bible explain that the Hebrew for woman is ish sha, I S H S H A, ish sha, while the Hebrew for man is just ish. No comments, please. Luther writes, quote, Hence it is that Adam gave the name woman, Isha, or man formed female, virago or vira in the Latin, to Eve. Adam Albert Barnes writes, To this counterpart of myself shall be called woman. The word in the original being a feminine form of man, to which we have no exact equivalent. Though the word woman, parentheses, womb man, or wife man, proves our word man to have been originally of the common gender. Because out of a man was she taken, being taken out of a man she is human, and being a perfect individual she is a female man. There, Ooh, got through that. Now you understand. If this is confusing to you, believe me, it's much worse. Let me try to pull all this together. The idea here is that if we think of the word man in the sense of mankind, the woman as the various etymologies reveal, is different yet of the same genus. She came from man, so she is a man. But she's a different sex. Through the miraculous transformation by God the surgeon. What a guy. I mean, wow. He can do anything. So she is a woe man. Woe man. Not ish, but isha, the feminine of ish. There. 
24, unless anyone stops me. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Here is the root and essence of biblical marriage. This verse is often assumed to be a continuation of Adam's statement in verse 23, but all of our common translations, all of our common versions, close the quotes at the end of verse 23 and do not place 24, verse 24, in quotes. This decision by the translators is probably based, at least in part, on what Jesus says in Matthew 19. Let's look at that. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. He answered, Have you not read that Jesus created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let them let not man separate. Well, you're doing so good. <laughs> so there, Jesus credits the statement to he who created them. That is, Yahweh God. I would add to this that at this point in creation, what would Adam know about mothers and fathers? Unless God told him. So it makes sense to credit this to the writer, Moses. Of course, no matter who spoke or wrote it, it's all by the inspiration of God's Spirit. So ultimately, even if Adam did utter the words, it's a, it was of God. So this verse begins, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and cleave to his wife. I have long seen the practical wisdom in this statement. And its truth was played out in our marriage. Just days after we were wed in Marshalltown, upon my return from Vietnam, we packed up all our earthly belongings, I believe it was a Chevy pickup with a shell on the back, crammed to the gills and headed down the road to return to California, where I was still stationed in the Navy for two more years. Linda and I were all of 18 and 19, respectively. I was all of six months older. I guess I still am. Now, we can attest to making some pretty dumb mistakes in those early days. At such a young age. But we address those mistakes together as husband and wife. Not by leaning on either of our parents. Dealing with situations that arose with each other rather than with the counsel of our parents accelerated the process of becoming one, I believe. We met the vagaries and pitfalls of life by leaning on each other. In 1971, there was no internet, no email, no smartphones. It was too expensive to call across country at every turn. Now, in that first year, we were indeed visited by our parents. Her mother first. <laughs> Is my baby still alive? <laughs> An anecdote that has nothing to do with anything. I was so young. We said, okay, while she was here, we were going to go eat at a fancy restaurant. 
the three of us. I believe it was down on the bay. Yeah, it was like a ship on the bay. Yeah, what? Oh, the Reuben E. Lee. She even remember Reuben E. Lee. So we had a nice dinner, had a little wine with our steak and all that. And, and so the bill, the bill was 19 and change. Now, that's three people eating a steak dinner. That was 1971. $19 and change. So I said, okay. So I put down a 20 and we walked out. And the guys in the band always joked, said, that you go in that same restaurant now, there's this plaque over the, <laughs> over the says, watch out for Lample. Because I, I tipped the waiter something like 35 cents or something. <laughs> hey, I was 19 years old. What do you want? <laughs> okay, that has nothing to do with... Could be. I mean, I don't know what my pay was, but it wasn't much. It wasn't much. And then my parents came later too, but they visited, but we otherwise we were on our own. Some earlier translations made this a man shall forsake his father and mother, and I think that's too harsh. That's the commandment still stands to honor one's parents, to respect their counsel and to ensure their well being. But it's important as Christ and the apostles attested to see that marriage, while not breaking the familial tie, does recast, humanly speaking, one's first allegiance, one's first dependency, one's primary bond. God always comes first, but one's husband or wife comes next. That's it. And they shall become one flesh. Note, please, the important tense of the verb. It is not our one flesh. Or even are made one flesh. But shall become. Shall become one flesh. Like sanctification, becoming one flesh is a process. This makes clear that it means far more than just the conjoining that occurs on the honeymoon. And just as with sanctification, the manner in which this occurs and the length of time it takes varies, varies from one marriage to another. For some couples, this oneness begins maturing early on. For others... It may never occur, sadly. For most, I would guess it takes many years, for it requires learning to take joy together, to share sorrows together, to trust and respect each other together. I'm always amazed watching a movie or reading a book or seeing in real life people who Marriages that break up over money. Money? That's sufficient? That doesn't make sense to me at all. You work through that together. That's what it's part of being married. Being of one flesh is difficult, maybe even impossible to describe. It's one of those things that falls into the category of you have to be there. Believe me, at 19 years of age, I had no idea what it would look like. Didn't have a clue. Again, if we liken it to sanctification, if you became a follower of Christ when you were young, could you possibly have realized then what your relationship with Christ and the Father would feel or look like 30, 40, 50 years later? I don't think so. I doubt that you could. I doubt that you could imagine the depth of understanding of His Word and His ways that comes only by experience and inspiration over the years. 
I doubt that you could imagine the profound depth of faith and trust in your Lord that has come only by living and walking with Him all these years. All this comes over the years and is rather difficult to explain to a babe in Christ. Just so the experience of being one flesh, like sanctification in Christ, it can only be realized and appreciated by those who give themselves over to it, who embrace the mystical union of husband and wife as something profound, fulfilling, and glorious. Now verse 25 of chapter 2, there isn't really that much to say about it. I heard that. Well, it is profound in that Remember our timeline. No sin. Why are we ashamed? Why are we guilty? Why do we feel guilty? Why sin? There wasn't any then. He saw her and she was just perfectly natural and he was perfectly natural and there you go. They didn't know anything else. Couldn't even occur to them. But next week as we turn the corner into chapter 3, Things go south. Immediately they're ashamed and they want to cover up. I'd like to close by reading 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. It paints a picture that seems to apply to both of these spiritual sanctification and maturing and being of one flesh with our mate. Paul writes, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. In other words, maturing, building glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit.